right. Well, welcome back. Again, we're thankful you're here with us today. We're uh, completing a series called The New Normal, and we're uh, uh, looking at how it affects the church. You know, California was the very first state to initiate complete lockdown. On March 19th, a Friday, uh, Governor Newsom uh, declared the uh, lockdown and it began on March 20. Exactly 21 weeks today, actually, in lockdown. In that time, we learned of things like the N95 mask, of social distancing, of, of restaurant closures and gym closures, and of course, church closures. More than that, this crisis has disrupted our very lives. Over the last four months, our globe, our nation, our economy, our cities, our economy, our communities, churches, our state, our lives have all been completely disrupted. How we were living prior to mid-March came to a complete and utter stop. Again, we're in a series called The New Normal. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at several institutions. We've looked at the new normal for what it means for marriages, for families. And today, we're looking at the church. We've seen what new normal could be over the last couple of weeks. New normal for a family life now may be that we grow to appreciate simply being under the same roof together. A new normal for economics now might be that we're more generous to others. We are more content with less, more willing to support small businesses or essential workers or churches and missionaries, more appreciative of the very paycheck we do get. A new normal might mean that families are outside more together. They're interacting and sharing life with their neighbors, checking in on the elderly, taking more walks together. A new normal might mean reading more, playing more games, calling extended family members. But today we're going to look at what a new normal looks like for the church, and specifically a new normal for Maranatha Community Church and her people. Churches were declared a non-essential service by the governor. And uh, I'm not sure how that comes about, since I believe that spiritual life is extremely essential, but um, that became a state political matter. We were allowed to open, but only for a few weeks, only allowed to open from May 12 through July 17. That was seven of the last 21 weeks. The rest of the time, we were in closure, as you see today. Pastors and congregants alike have had to stretch. They've streamed their services or held drive-in services in their church parking lots or posted sermons to social media sites. Smaller church pastors who lack the benefit of those technologies have burnt CDs and even written out their Sunday sermons and mailed them to their folks in the fellowship. Pastor John MacArthur, you may know him as a famous Christian art, art, author, um, recently declared that he was going to keep his church open no matter what. Well, the county of Los Angeles and the state of California decided to sue the pastor, declaring that he was going to be fined $1,000 a day that he was open. In response, John MacArthur, with a nonprofit legal aid, um, countersued the state of California and the county of Los Angeles. And just yesterday, a ruling came down. That was a very limited ruling in a very limited situation. But the judge decided there that, yes, churches are essential and that John MacArthur's church can stay open during the trial period, and, uh, but uh, there had to be a, um, a contingency. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur agreed that there would be masks and there would be social distancing, but that's an interesting step in how the church is going to be related to in the state of California. But we do need to realize something. It's a very limited application here. It only applies to that church. It only applies to that county. And it doesn't mean that the case is going to go in favor of the church at all. And in fact, it could mean that at the other end, um, they will be owing the $1,000 fine for all the weeks they were open. But we will watch it just to make sure that we're staying on top of how the state sees the church operating within its borders. But you know what? Even if John MacArthur were immediately effective yesterday and churches across the state were allowed to open, what's more important of the, of the win is when we do return, what will the church actually look like? You know, if you can recall that life after 9-11 changed drastically for Americans. Life after 2008 with the Great Recession changed drastically. Some changes were very frustrating. After 9-11, you had bag checks at nearly every um, public event. It used to be you could go to the Carmack to welcome or send off your family and friends at the airport no longer. 
uh, all of a sudden after 9-11 we had to remove our belts and our shoes and our, and our laptops had to be opened up and in the case and we had those super x-ray machines that would check out everything. We had to be careful of unaccompanied luggage and boxes at the airport for fear that there would be something in them. All of that became a, a thing after 9-11 and remains a thing even today. Now some changes are arguably for the better. In my own industry, I'm a bivocational pastor of real estate, for example. In 2008, we had the Great Recession. The results of that um, were that there were banking and real estate laws and procedures drastically changed to protect the consumer. Here in 2020, now with the COVID-19 virus, we have virtual tours and virtual listing appointments. Showings are only allowed to individuals who can prove that they have seen the property virtually and are pre-qualified for the pro property. And there's certain open house rules that need to be in place to keep everyone safe. Those are not bad changes. In fact, they actually make my life easier as a real estate agent. You know, there's a saying that says, change is unkind to the unprepared. So we need certainly to prepare. Pastor Kerry Newhoff in Outreach Magazine just last month, well, actually June, June of 2020, uh, produced an article that included some important questions that churches need to ask as they consider reopening. Number one, will infrequent church attendance become the universal default? Infrequent church attendance, it impacts almost every church today, regardless of size, denomination, or even location. If you grew up in church for a long time, you were likely raised never to miss a week of church. Your record would be 50 out of 52 if you took a two-week vacation. Long before COVID, however, those days were already pretty much gone. Why is that? Well, I think there's several factors, and they're not evil factors. They're just factors that play into it. For one, we have greater affluence. Money gives people more options, more opportunities. There's a higher focus on our kids' activities now. A growing number of kids are playing sports, and a growing number of parents choose sports over church, if that becomes a conflict. We have more travel in our society today. Despite environmental concerns, travel is on the rise. More and more families of various ages travel for leisure, even if it's just out of town to go camping to, or to a friend's place for the weekend or a weekend at the lake. When people are out of town, they tend not to be in church. And then there's blended and single parent families. Fortunately, more and more of these families are finding a home in the church, but we need to remember that when custody is shared in a family situation, perfect attendance for a kid or teen might be 26 weeks a year, not 52. Similarly, single parents might not be in church because they lack access to reliable transportation. Then there's self-directed spirituality. I mean by that, we live in an era in which no parent would make a visit to a doctor's office without having first Googled the symptoms of the child's illness and a recommended course of treatment. Just ask any family physician today, it drives them nuts. Here is a fact though, according to most doctors, Google is not a complete replacement for medical school. And then there's declining trust and reliance on institutions. The church in many people's minds today is seen as an institution. I don't actually believe that's what a church is. I think it's a movement, not an institution. But many churches today behave like an institution and the postmodern mind instinctively moves away from it as a result. Either way, we know that we have infrequent church attendance. Second question, will online church replace in-person attendance for many? The last decade has seen an explosion of online options for Christians, most of which are free. Social media, podcasts, services both live streamed and on demand. There's no way to shield the congregation from a changing world. And actually, if you come to think about it, there really shouldn't be. The church has always adapted to a changing world. But does law online participation drive Christians into deeper engagement with that mission or deeper into consumerism? And what happens to evangelism in a low attendance world like we're at now? If you're consuming your faith online and only attending sporadically, how do you invite your friends into that? You can, but posting a YouTube link on your page is not the same as personally sharing your life and your witness with a friend. Third question. Dr. Newhoff asked, how much of a virtual experience actually translate into life? With almost every congregation now streaming their services, it raises the question of what happens on the other end of that service, right where you're sitting right now. Think about this, a high percentage of couples today meet online. 
but no couple who meets online wants to stay online. The goal is to eventually meet in person and maybe even start a life together. Should Christians be different? Even if you sit in rapt attention to what's being streaming on your device right now, and I hope you certainly are. Is it the same as being in this room? It's not. There's a connectivity that you, that's missing. And the fourth question he asks, what happens to kids whose parents only attend online? This one hits me particularly hard as I think about the children in our church and how much I miss them and how much that they are uh, missing uh, interaction with each other because it's now against the rules. Parents will often skip out on attending church because they're busy or, or they want a day off. But they can easily catch up on a message, maybe even still get in on a small group. But what about the kids? You can't download a relationship. You can't download a friendship. What happens to a generation of kids who grow up relationally disconnected? Actually, I think we're seeing the results of that already. Just turn on the daily news. It's only natural to long for a return to the quote-unquote good old days. But it makes you wonder if we can ever go back to the old normal. Many say they're concerned that after the pandemic, the church will never be the same again. In some ways, though, I'm more concerned that the church will be the same again. What do I mean by that? Well, for 2,000 years, our world has had pandemics and epidemics. What's happened in and during, especially after the pandemic, hasn't drastically changed the structure of the church in, in most of those 2,000 years. First, we built cathedrals and we gathered in them, and then the, the great Black Death plague came. After the Black Death, we gathered in cathedrals all over again. You can't assume that the church back then was unaware that gathering together accelerated the speed of sickness. True, they might not have known about flattening the curve, but certainly they knew that gathering together exposed them to more possible illness. See, I'm less concerned that the church will be forever changed and more concerned that we will somehow snap right back into what old status quo was. My hope, my prayer, is that Maranatha will not go back to normal. Instead, that we may take the best of what we're seeing now and continue those things. Tony Moran is an author. He wrote the book, The Unstuck Church, and he said this, interruptions jolt us. They upset the equilibrium. They force a reaction. Interruptions challenge us to pause and assess what's happening then build a plan to respond, and ultimately, interruptions provoke us to act. I think this interruption, the interruption caused by COVID-19, is going to force us at Maranatha to embrace our new normal, to strengthen our church's mission. But that will also include shifting ministry strategy, to spread the gospel in a culture that was already changing well before the disruption, the interruption, if you will, that this virus caused. Here are several shifts that I think that Maranatha will need to make in the very near future as a result of this very crisis. Number one, there's going to need to be a shift from analog to digital. This one's obvious. We're, we're online with everything. However, what may not be obvious is that digital is not going away after the virus is eventually wiped out. Churches need to shift to make this a primary, uh, primary platform for everything they do rather than just a stream of their weekend services. So a shift from analog to digital. Secondly, a shift from teaching to equipping. Just about every environment and program that churches have offered in the past was designed to teach people using a one-way communication, a talking head sitting in a pulpit talking to a room full of faces. That's not the way it can work right now. Rather than doing that, we need to equip people with the tools and resources they need to engage the Bible, to practice spiritual disciplines and live out God's mission for their lives. We need to help people move from consuming content to instead engaging a personal spiritual journey to follow and to become like Jesus Christ. Shift from analog to digital, shift from teaching to equipping, shift from gathering to connecting. After this crisis, people will understand the need for friendship, need for community. There's a reason solitary confinement and isolation is used as a punishment. God designed us to need one another. Weeks and months of social distancing will make people more aware than ever that it's not good to be alone. Fourthly, a shift from global to local. We can continue sending financial resources to help local churches and ministry organizations in other countries. But it's important to realize that God has specifically placed us, our church, in our community to reach our mission field. 
and we need to approach it that way. Fifth, a shift from overspending to generosity. With declines in giving, churches will need to partner with local agencies and churches to address spiritual and physical and mental health issues. We need to watch our expenditures, whether it's uh, new buildings or new payroll. Uh, more and more pastors will become bivocational, as I am, uh, where they um, lean on another job out in the community, out in the world, so to speak, for their pay. Uh, Maranatha does not give me a salary. Doesn't, Maranatha doesn't pay me anything. And I believe more and more and more pastors are going to go that route as well. Six, the shift from counting attendees and, and now viewers to engagement. Again, this is a trend that we saw happening long before COVID. But we could easily shift from thinking attendance was our win to thinking the number of viewers on our online services is the win. When really the Bible tells us that making disciples that's our win. We want to connect people with the body of Christ so that they have a chance to hear and to respond to the gospel. That means we need to move just beyond counting how many people show up online to engaging our new guests and helping them take their next steps towards Jesus Christ. Again, um, Tony says this, that's a starting point for the conversations that I think churches need to be ha having beginning today. Not when the church reopens, if you wait until then, it'll probably be too late. It'll be too easy to go back to doing church the way we've always done church. And we will have missed the opportunity of capitalizing on what we're learning through this interruption. Though we'd all probably wish that things would get back to normal the way they were prior to the pandemic shutdown in, in March. It's unlikely though that that will be the case. We all must accept the fact that our churches, just like individuals and society as a whole, are likely to be impacted by the pandemic for months and yes, even years to come. So knowing that, instead of trying to make things happen just like they used to, we instead need to consider what changes can be made, should be made, so that we can adapt to the inevitable fact that society around us is changing. And we need to be prepared to embrace new methods moving forward. Here are three key areas which I think we need to consider adapting as we enter a new reality. And these three areas is what our executive council will be working on over the next few weeks and months. First is programming. I look at things like online presence. Instead of treating online ministry as some short-term fad that will soon go away as soon as we get a vaccine or as soon as we have herd immunity or whatever, we should instead consider how to keep an online presence as an integral part of our workflow moving forward. It's likely that large segments of our congregation and our community still won't feel comfortable gathering for a while in large crowds. And we owe it to them to continue to provide content so that they can have a worship experience. So instead of dialing down an online ministry, maybe we should look and see how ways we can expand it. This could also result in a continued expansion of social media content, like using brief, brief video clips as a marketing tool to continue to boost interest and engagement and renewed emphasis on more of a social presence in our Facebook account, our YouTube account, our Instagram? If so, do we need to identify certain days of the week dedicated perhaps to recording and editing that content, which may now need to happen at the expense of other projects and other tasks? Additionally, does our online giving platform need to continue to improve and expand? Do we need to improve how we receive prayer requests and requests for information from online church visitors? So our online presence will have to be looked at. Our worship. The church is central to God's plan in the world, but it's not the center of God's plan in the world. What is the church? Ephesians 3.10 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And in the same way, gathered corporate worship is central, but should not be the center of our church life. The gathered worship of God is certainly important. Indeed, it's one of the marks of the biblical church that was taken away from us, which is why it's so hard to live through this quarantine period. The church, though, has not always been able to gather in ways that we enjoy and love. However, the lack of gathering has actually helped us, I believe, to emphasize other areas in the life of the church. How do we better engage our online viewers in church worship? We need to look at things like virtual communion, virtual baptism, virtual children's messages, interactive Bible studies, and small group discussions online as well. Then there's worship. 
specifically children's worship comes to mind. It is so hard right now that even when we were open for those seven weeks, we were not allowed to have any children's ministry, including nursery. And so children had to sit quietly and not so quietly with their parents in the room together. We need ministry for our kids, and maybe that's something we can boost in the online presence. This crisis has focused us on the impact that has had on marginalized people. We've seen incarcerated persons, uh, persons in prison and the homeless population who really can't keep social distance from one another. And then there's senior communities, senior assisted living and nursing homes. We know that they are vulnerable and yet we need to find ways to minister to them. How about the homebound? Those who are um, uh, not able to be around others because they fear COVID so much so they're homebound and they're vulnerable. We need to help them to get food, to get prescriptions, to get whatever. And then as we face this uh, economic reality of this COVID-19, we also see that there are many who are either unemployed now, I believe it's over 50 million in the country, or those who will soon be, if not um, furloughed, at least unemployed. And so we need to think about them. And then we need to think about the first responders and the healthcare workers who are on the front lines on a daily basis with this disease, this, this virus, this pandemic. So worship, ministries, discipleship. You know, one of the things that we can do with online church is something that we started to do from the very beginning and inception of this church, is, this church, is the Maranatha Bible Institute, where there'll be online training classes in areas of, of Bible study and in areas of, of evangelism and church history. And we want to continue that too. But in order for all of this to happen, all of the stuff we just described, that means we need to be willing to take a longer look at how we utilize our volunteers and staff in ministry roles. And that leads us to point number two, a shift in people. In chess, the queen is the most powerful piece. But my chess club teacher in high school taught us not to rely on that queen. He would often have us remove the queen at the start of a game, leaving both chess players with no queen on either side. When you do this, you're forced to use all the other pieces, the rooks, the pawns, the knights, the bishops. I wonder, are there ways that production team members can be cross-trained so that they can know how to execute multiple roles if needed? Are there tasks that can be automated or scripted so less people are required to do them? Can more equipment be added that can be operated remotely as opposed to everyone needing to be in the same place and in close proximity to one another? Beyond simply having people to fill roles, do we need to ensure that they're trained well enough to do what we're asking? So before services ramp up again, before we're allowed to go back and have physical services, we may need to consider doing a brief retraining or a practice session for teams so they can adapt to new changes and work off the rust that naturally comes from being idle for several weeks. Can we start to create training tools now, whether documents or simple videos shot on our phones, where the people can access during the week to get an overview of the roles and the concepts without having to be here in person? Wouldn't it be amazing if you think through this process, this new normal, wouldn't it be amazing if we didn't go back to consumer-driven Christianity where people line up like customers at a Costco, but instead we see ourselves, every single one of us, as co-laborers in the gospel. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. May this be true at Maranatha before during and especially after the pandemic. And the third piece that we need to look at is the process. Beyond just the digital experience, our in-person experiences may have to change too. Moving forward into the new normal, our processes need to be modified to reflect whatever the new world is that we're living in. Safety precautions for months, perhaps years to come. It will be commonplace and accepted for public spaces, including churches, to be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized and disinfected regularly. So that needs to become a regular part of our church workflow. Commonplace things we've never really given much attention to in the past, like microphones and instruments and doorknobs and countertops and light switches, faucet handles, computer keyboards, mice. They were never really on our radar in the, in the housekeeping aspect, but now we need to pay special attention to those. We need checklists for what the new normal is for greeting people, for seating people, for the nursery workers, for food handling, for the flow of people through our, our uh, building. 
as we embark on our new normal. It's a path that we must all be willing to walk together. As we close this, this morning's message and our series, I would suggest we look forward to the months and years ahead. We need to ask ourselves, how can we continue on the positive ideas and focus that we've seen emerge? You know, we need to be encouraged through all of this. It, it's easy to be discouraged. You know, discouragement just means a lack of encouragement. And, and it's easy as we see all the things being thrown at us from the left, from the right, and, and just dealing with life itself. It can be easy to be discouraged. You know, I couldn't help but have my mind drawn this week to a book of Haggai. Only two chapters long. It's an easy read. I would encourage you to do so. God's people had returned from exile in Babylon and Persia. They came back excited about renewing worship once again in their old land. They had begun the work to reinstitute sacrifices and temple worship. But things then came to a standstill. See, things of life just began to get in the way. In chapter 2, we find for some it was a time of great joy, but for others there was sadness. See, the place of worship was not the same as it had once been to those who had seen it in the past. And we too may find ourselves in that situation when we return and old church normal is not the same as new church normal. I hope we don't miss that though things have changed, the one whom we worship still remains the same. Throughout this short book, God's leaders and people are urged to be strong, to stay strong. Are we to be strong in our own ability, though? No. We're to be strong in the Lord, no matter the task that he sets before us. Not once, but twice in this book, the Lord reminds his people that he is with them, that his spirit remains among them. In times of uncertainty, churches are presented with an opportunity to respond in one of two ways. They can flourish and thrive in the face of adversity, or they can cave in to the pressures. What is God asking our church, Maranatha, to do? Remember, whatever the task is, we are joining God in that mission. We are never alone. May our routines always involve careful attention to the scriptures so that our lives and church are guided by them in the things that we do and say and think. Our priorities should always be given to the word of God as we speak its encouragement to one another. Sing its truths to one another. Read its warnings and commandments to one another. Pray its confessions together. Listen to its authority as it's preached among us. As we consider these shifts and changes, one thing is for certain. Returning back to old normal after such a historic moment as this would be nothing short of missing one of the greatest opportunities of our lifetime. We've been handed, whether we ask for it or not, we've been handed the chance to be better to do better. And now we just need to act upon that very thing. Let us pray.